Louisa Connolly displayed these characters uh, through her devotion to her husband, uh, Tom, and her extended family. Even the discovery of his maintenance of a mistress coming to light in 1803 after his death did not destroy her love and devotion. I met with a blow that almost destroyed me, she wrote, but also the fair. My rooted affection for him remains unshaken. So much for the stereotype. It is in other areas that our high intelligence and familiarity with wider reading, particularly works emanating from France, must be assessed. As Henry said, she spent her childhood in France and she knew French before she could speak English. There is ample evidence that the texts of French authors of the Enlightened movement, such as Rousseau, Voltaire, Montesquieu, and others, enjoyed a readership in Ireland. I use the term enlightenment to describe ideas of the 18th century that emphasized the use of reason to pursue knowledge, advance the human condition, and pursuit of happiness. It believed strongly in individual rights and political and religious toleration. It held that education was crucial to human advancement, and she held all these views. Indeed, Emily, Duchess of Leinster, her sister, invited the celebrated Rousseau to be tutored to her children. The offer was declined. An understanding of the motivation and purpose of her work in refurbishing and managing the house and estate must be set in the context of the Enlightenment values and fashion among women of her class and education. She and others like her were readers proficient in French and interested in new ideas in writing, architecture, landscaping, and gardening. By her involvement in landscape design and building refurbishment, she developed for herself an area of personal autonomy and control. Between 1758 and 1821, she effectively masterminded the reconfiguration of Casper and House and Estate. The influence of Rousseau, particularly his work Emile, where he praises rural life or urban, and as he who wrote, Man is destroyed in the cities, a modern theme, can be seen in her promotion of cottages on the estate and the bathhouse, the remains of which can be seen today. In 1778, she describes how she spent the summer bathing, dining, and living at the cottage. The cottage we now believe to be Batty Langley, known as Batty Langley Lodge. She took an interest in politics. You must know, she wrote to her sister Sarah in 1768, that I am a great politician with regard to Ireland. By the middle of the 18th century, support for some form of legislative independence for Ireland began to grow. Such ideas began to seep into the areas culture, politics, and intellectual discussion inhabited by Louisa Connolly. Part of that consciousness supported the development of Irish trade by buying only Irish manufacture. And in the case of Louisa Connolly, supporting the development of a hat factory in Selridge. An English newspaper was to write, the straw bonnets now so much in fashion originated in Ireland and from a praiseworthy motive in Lady Louisa Connolly. In the matter of the American Revolution, her support for the colonists was unequivocal, referring to George III as that hardened wretch for his opposition to concessions to the Americans. Out of that political ferment developed the period known as Grattan's Parliament, when Ireland gained a great measure of legislative independence. To quote R.F. Foster, Grattan's Parliament did represent rhetorically the odd sense of Irishness felt by the ascendancy, which helps to explain why it was so easily co-opted into later nationalist tradition. It may well have been co-opted, but not necessarily always acknowledged. The central point being that Louisa Connolly and others, through their commitment to legislative independence and toleration for Catholics, helped the development of an ongoing sense of Irish separateness. As Henry has said, the French Revolution, the Anglo-French Wars that followed, and the savages of the 1798 rebellion changed all irrevocably. Unlike others of her class, Louisa Connolly did not allow the events of 1798 to develop in her feelings of hatred or resentment. The dominant emotion expressed is one of sorrow arising from the brutality of the times. Her distress and innate humanity is never obscured. And again, to follow on from Henry. By 1799, Louisa Connolly had come to accept the Act of Union as a solution to the problems of Ireland, coming as it did with commitments to economic support for Ireland and Catholic emancipation. Her acceptance of the Union must be seen in the context of its time, where it could be seen as a bold and innovative commitment to bring peace and economic security to Ireland. And it failed. It failed for the usual reasons. The British establishment failed to live up to its commitments. From 1800, she avoided politics and focused instead on her enlightenment principles of working for the common good and social harmony through charitable works and education. An early project was the provision of a site and funds for the building of Christchurch within the gates of Castletown, completed in 1813. Typically, she was lavish with her advice on architecture and design to the architect she employed. She had long retained an interest in education through the care and maintenance of Selbridge Charity School. In 1809, she was prepared to enhance its future by transferring it to the incorporated society so that from then on it was known as the Selbridge Charter School. We now know it as the Selbridge Manor Hotel. It always retained her financial support and her influence ensured that its character, being exclusively female, was retained. 
The scars of 1798 were deep and long-lasting and left with a commitment to the development of toleration, especially religious toleration in our community. Thus, she established a co-educational and multi-denominational school of industry, what we now call a vocation school, on the site of her late husband's hunting kennels. I had Catholics and Protestants all mixed up, as they should be. Her interest in the transformative ability of charitable works never waned. Even when she travelled abroad, as she did with her lease Louisa Napier in 1814 to Brussels and Holland, she visited various charitable institutions, always open to new ideas. In Selbridge, she was noted for her compassion and practical generosity. The Castanel papers in the Ar National Architectural Archive and Trinity College Dublin that I've read are full of entries in the account books over the decades. To a poor woman, by your ladyship's orders. To a poor man, by your ladyship's orders. The quotation referred to by Mr. Burgess and used as an epitaph in the lit publication here contains sentiments that seem to have governed her life. In 1838, Lords Glengall and Lismore of the County Tipperary wrote to Thomas Drummond, the Chief Under Secretary of State for Ireland, asking for increased military support in suppressing a peasantry enraged by their deprivation. He was right back to them in words that are celebrated in history texts. Property has its duties as well as its rights. To the neglect of these duties in times past, it is mainly to be ascribed that diseased state of society in which such crime, crimes take their rise. That was written in 1838 and is celebrated. Lady Louisa Connolly was making those points in 1820. I think part, uh, we have a knowledge or an inter or, uh, understanding of her has been, I think, behind an aesthetic veil for far too long. I think it's female historians like um, Gillian Byrne and Ruth Hall and others have allowed us to see beyond that and see behind that aesthetic veil a woman of intellect, uh, a woman of historic consequence, and a woman worth commemorating.